Well, thanks very much for joining us. I'm joined by the uh, input output management team, many of you uh, of whom you've already met. Um, so um, let me start. I mean, maybe I could start with you, Charles. I mean, most innovations from the Industrial Revolution through to the World Wide Web, they started out in the world's most advanced economies. You're kind of turning on this on its head. Uh, your focus on blockchain is now very much in the developing world. W why is that? Well, you always go where there's a demand for the products that you build. And uh, if you look at government technology, you look at the way that money works, if you look at the developed society, uh, there's not as a strong of a demand for upgrading or changing in the United States or the European Union as there are in Eastern Europe, Africa, Southeast Asia, and other places. Uh, globalization is, for the most part, working okay for the United States and okay for Europe. Now, there's a certain lot of issues here and there, and there's the Rust Belt in the U.S., and we've lost a lot of our manufacturing base, and of course, there's the Great Reset. But all things considered, uh, we're winning, whereas some other parts of the world aren't moving as quickly. So you don't do the same thing over and over again. That's the definition of insanity. Rather, what you do is you take a step back and you say, okay, how can we compete differently? So there's a much broader set of things you can do, and everything is on the table. New voting systems, new property systems, new payment systems, new way of identifying people, new way of trading securities. A great example would be the country of Estonia. They, uh, they leave the Soviet bloc, and they kind of have to start in the 90s from ground zero. And now suddenly you can vote online. Now you have a national ID card. You have a lot of digitization of the infrastructure that surpasses anything in the UK or the United States. And that's because they didn't have a legacy system to protect. So if we say, okay, where will the greatest demand for the type of technology we build be over the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, it's going to start in places like the continent of Africa, uh, the subcontinent of India. The, it's going to start in places like Mongolia or the country of Georgia. It's not going to be in the United States, in California or New York or other such places. They're going to have to catch up. And you see that again and again and again, where you have startups out-competing uh, old stodgy monopolies. The, the Microsofts out-compete the IBMs, and then the next cohort comes and out-competes the Microsoft and so forth. It's an endless cycle of innovation. I mean, this brings us on to the concept and sense of leapfrogging, which is very well used in Africa. Some people you know, are skeptical about it. I, mean, I don't know if I could bring in one of the other panelists, but do you see this potential really to, to leapfrog when some of the physical infrastructure, for example, the roads and the ports and the rail are still very shoddy in many cases? Can technology really help? Honestly, I think that's a misconception. Uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. And uh, if you look at, for example, internet connectivity, by 2030, the vast majority of people in Africa, well over 90%, will have high-speed internet connectivity through some means, either it's cellular or satellite. I mean, just look at what uh, Starlink is doing and look at the proliferation of 5G. Uh, the cost of getting people online is going down and, and the technologies used to get people online don't involve trenching out millions of miles of fiber optic cable. Uh, it's just a broadcast. And then you look at these cell phones that we have, they're supercomputers and our upgrade cycles every 24 to 36 months. And where do they go after we upgrade? They don't just disappear. They don't just go throw into a landfill. They become accessible to a different group of people. Uh, so the innovations of today are available tomorrow. So I think within 10 years, uh, whatever infrastructure gap may be apparent, uh, that's going to be closed. And the cost of doing things always falls. Once you have that baseline of infrastructure, in the digital commons, we're all equal. We all have access to the same educational content. We all have access to the same platforms, the, the, the same payment systems, the same way of doing business. So it becomes uh, much more competitive and it becomes much more merit-based rather than geographic uh, or, uh, or other considerations. Um, I think on top of the lack of a legacy system to replace um, and an obvious need to actually provide these services they don't have, I think demographics also plays an important factor. So I think in the African continent, the population is by and large much younger than in the Western world and new technologies are adopted far more quickly from uh, from the, from the newer generations. The other point I think which is important is that this is a new technology that offers new features. And so in the past, if you had an idea and a problem to solve, the pieces that were missing was getting talent to bear to solve that problem and funding. So places like Silicon Valley and these centers of innovation were the primary drivers of innovation. 
with the blockchain, what's happening is you're democratizing this. You're giving access to a global infrastructure that allows for social and financial inclusion on a global scale. So on the on the on the opportunities that we worked on in Africa, um, we leverage the global team off of four continents, and the funding comes from the mechanism. And we also have a governance system in place that democratizes this. So anybody anywhere that has a good idea can use this system to uh, to bring that idea to fruition, and that's that's unique. Um, this was this was previously only the purview of of the innovation centers, and now this is becoming flatter and innovation is going to the edges. And this is going to be uh, the final piece of the puzzle of, uh, of the internet that was missing, which is uh, the democratization of it, not you know, before the, the big companies centralized it and access to the talent and funding, which they didn't have in the past. Danelle, maybe I could bring you in. I mean, you've announced this uh, blockchain deploy deployment deal with the Ethiopian government. You know, what exactly is the nature of this deal? And how can you convince us that this is going to be anything more than a flash in the pan? Um, yeah, I mean, even before I answer your question, I actually had a, an interesting story to tell. Um, so I was recently in in, in Zambia and um, I wanted to verify my uh, birth certificate. So I went over to the, the birth certificate registry office and um, I handed them my, my birth certificate and said, look, um, can you verify that this is authentic? And then, you know, he looked at me and literally from the floor to the ceiling were just stacks and stacks of birth certificates. and uh, it's like, well, where do you start? I mean, <laughs> this could take years uh, before you're able to do so. Either you believe me, uh, which is what I ended up doing. He just kind of stamped it and I walked away with it. Um, so what I'm just trying to say is that the Africa is really hungry for, for solutions. So really anything that we can give um, in that context to kind of help him with his job would be uh, really beneficial. Um, and, and coming back to kind of your your question, um, the, the deal with Ethiopia is hugely exciting. Um, you know, we're the first... Uh, provider in Ethiopia that will be issuing a government endorsed ID. Uh, that's a mm -hmm. big deal. And um, and this is only the starting point, right? So uh, we're working with the Ministry of Education, but uh, we're seeing um, really the same level of interest ac across all government ministries. And they uh, the huge silos that exist across all these uh, ministries. So managing one ID that gives you access to uh, to all government services. and. It's not just government, it's one ID that opens up the private sector as well. So, uh, you know, suddenly your banks, uh, your uh, insurance companies, um, your telcos can, can leverage this uh, government um, issued ID that's, uh, that they can verify as, as authentic. And what that does is, you know, you have a reusable ID that you can use in, in multiple mm -hmm. areas. And, um, you know, the potential for that's massive to increase efficiencies even. I mean, if you listen to uh, BCG, uh, you know, the Australian government just digitizing IT has had an uplift of 11 billion. And if you look at what McKinsey is saying around Ethiopia, um, you know, there's potential to uplift, I think, even up to 7% of GDP by uh, introducing the type of technology we're bringing to the country. Um, I mean, in terms of specific applications, one thinks of things like um, medical records, um, one thinks of uh, agricultural supply chains and verifying those. Um, land registration is something else. I mean, these are these are things that are, that have just occurred to me. I mean, are any of these th applications that you can see being rolled out, you know, across the continent because of this this technology? So the answer is yes. You know, the demand is already there. Um, when I'm working with governments across the continent, there is a clear appetite to be able to roll out digital identity across a variety of government services. I would say digital identity is the one commonality across almost every single country on the continent. They have 2025, 2050 vision statements, and all of them require digital identity. So that appetite is already there. Uh, we're, we're not doing anything particularly revolutionary here. We're servicing a demand which already exists, uh, but just using a new and more innovative technology to be able to service that. So I think that's where it gets exciting for us. Just to reiterate, this is the first government deal um, which uses blockchain in any serious or meaningful way, in my, in my particular opinion. Five million identities issued by the Ethiopian government to the W3C standards issued on our platform. So that's why it's exciting, because this is the beginning of making identity useful. Previously, identities, you can't share them. 
right? So you've got this paper-based ID in Ethiopia, piece of cardboard, even though this is a legal government identity, what can you do with it? There's no utility. Uh, what we've done is actually created an identity which can be shared across an ecosystem of partners. So even though you know this current project is focused around what are my educational credentials and extensible into what, what do I get in my degree? Eventually, you're going to be able to share a single link with an employer to prove you've done what you've said you've done, but also potentially with a financial provider and be able to use this flexible and useful identity to be able to get finance or other financial services. So this is why it's exciting, um, because we're really at the beginning. And Charles, the, the, you've spoken before, I know, about agricultural supply chains. I think you've done some work in Mongolia. I mean, this is interesting to me. You know, one thinks of coffee, tea, um, even cobalt. Um, you know, how, how could this be, how could this technology, um, you know, actually verify these supply chains? Yeah, it, the most fundamental thing is first know who people are. And when you say people, you're also talking about devices. You know, so IoT identity is a big deal. Your self-driving car has to be identified. Your drone has to be identified. Uh, and then once you have that base layer, then it's a discussion of transitions between those distinct actors. And those can be economic transitions. So the whether that's a purchase, it's the movement of money. They can be uh, other things like commodities, like the movement of coffee from one node to another node. All these things are identical when you actually strip off the, the, the skin and the face, the bones, and the muscles are the same. Uh, so this is why we enter in with identity and we get that infrastructure in place. And it's just a matter of a business and a social system at that point. Uh, so you always ask, well, what are you concerned about? What is your key driver? Is it uh, fraud reduction or increased transparency in the supply chain? Is it verification of claims such as uh, this was organically produced or there's fair trade or this is carbon negative or carbon neutral? Every marketplace is unique in its demands and the questions it asks. But once you have the, the right foundations, your cost of verifying these things usually goes down dramatically, in some cases over an order of magnitude. The other thing is it's universal. Once you've developed such a system, it doesn't matter if you're talking about a coffee supply chain in Java or a coffee supply chain in Costa Rica or in Ethiopia, the kinds of things you would do are reusable. So you build once, use everywhere. That's kind of the magic of software and the magic of the internet, the magic of infrastructure is that once we'd solve a very hard problem, that very hard problem became a very easy problem for everybody. And there was a reusability in that respect. Uh, so agriculture is certainly very important. Uh, we not only have stuff we've talked about in Mongolia, we also work with partners like Beef Chain and uh, the state of Wyoming. I, and uh, we even have people in the aquaponics business who come to us. We have people in the wine business who come to mm -hmm. us. There's a Cardano wine in Napa Valley over in California, and they keep sending me cases of it, and I keep giving it away, but it's a good wine. Uh, so it's something that we do care quite a bit about. Uh, and what's very exciting is what we've done here with PRISM in Ethiopia is a beginning. It's not an endpoint. It's something that will organically grow to cover more and more of the population. And then as we look to Digital Ethiopia 2025, that agenda the government has, we can have broader conversations about how do we extend what we've already constructed and deployed to cover more and more things. A final point is that a lot of the demand for these systems comes from commercial activity or from grants and uh, subsidy. So a lot of people like saying, well, I'll invest, but I need some audit terms and conditions. I'll go ahead and uh, give you access to this marketplace, but you have to prove certain things. So when you have these conversations, it's not just a cost center, it's usually a market opportunity center. In the case of Mongolia, for example, they have something called the third neighbors policy, where Mongolia wants to start exporting agricultural goods, in this case, beef, to the United States. The USDA is not going to let them do that unless they can prove certain things about that beef supply chain. So when you say, well, if we install this system, it's not just, well, spend all this money, do all this stuff to get this thing running, and then hypothetically, it's going to benefit you. You're saying, Directly after installing it, you now can sell into a new marketplace and in some cases even have a existing commercial commitment, which in many cases will pay far more than the cost of the installation. And that's what's really exciting about uh, this plan of ours as we roll out throughout the continent of Africa. Uh, we, we can kind of show how that escalation of market access, that reduction of cost and that universality is, uh, is going to be a cornerstone in the digitization of these economies up to 2025 and beyond.
the third neighbor there presumably being the US as opposed to Russia and China, is that right? To yeah. give Mongolia a different outlet, yeah. Um, I mean, a, a follow-up maybe for you or maybe for one of the other panelists, something else that, that we've spoken about in the past that you've talked about blockchain as a trust infrastructure, I think, presumably because these transactions are public, they're held on a decentralized network. I mean, this is a continent where, where trust in public institutions can be low, including in, in governments. And it's not as though, to be fair, blockchain, cryptocurrencies especially, haven't gone through their own fair share of, of scandals. And yet one can see the kind of the potential for transparency here. I mean, how do you see this sort of playing out in, 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 the, in the trust sense? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the core of the product that we're actually launching is about enabling uh, digital trust. Um, yeah. So uh, much like uh, your physical wallet, um, you know, in the, if you open it up, you've got your ID, your driver's license, medical insurance card. Normally, you just hand these over and, and the other people um, just trust existing systems to just verify that that's authentic. In the digital world, it's it's really hard uh, to, to do the same and there's a lot of issues with fraud and so on. Um, so one of the things that we've implemented is basically through this platform is to enable the same level of trust so people can basically treat uh, digital credentials in much the same way uh, as, um, as, um, as a physical credential and um, be able to share it and, and uh, the person receiving it can independently verify that without needing to contact the, the source. So um, we're leveraging blockchain really for, for that property that it enables and uh, we're enabling users really to have um, um, something uh, that they own. So all the credentials uh, are not held by some centralized party. They they're held in, in their mobile phone or in their um, encrypted personal uh, data vault. Um, so users have complete control and ownership and um, you know they're not giving up their trust to another party to hold these credentials. So come what may, they've always got that in their pocket and it's up to them to share that with people that they trust. Yeah, and trust you can look at from one or two directions. So you can either go from bottom up or top down. So bottom up is saying you inherit your trust from your culture, from your nation, from a, a group that you identify with. So I'm an American, okay? So any preconceived notion you have about people from the United States, positive or negative, uh, if we've never met, just hearing that title, you, you're gonna stick that on me. But trust can work in the other direction as well. So you can look at the, the individual and say, well, okay, he's American, but he's Charles Hoskinson, and perhaps I have a unique identity that transcends the place I come from. The magic of PRISM is that it allows us to leapfrog and that we can have a direct relationship with the people of a nation state and setting whatever the brand or preconceived notions happen to be aside and say, well, this is this, is this person. And you can prove facts about them, their education, their life stories, certain things that will allow you to say, yes, this is a reputable person. At that point, you don't need a strong reputation in the nation state to be able to conduct e-commerce, to be able to globalize, to be able to start a business. You can build a much more intimate, much more personal set. Well, collectively, if you do that for an entire economy, then bottom up, the, your impression of the nation state will just start reflecting the micro impressions you have of the people. I'll say, oh, I've, I've always worked with uh, the people from there. They're always honest. They're always nice. I, I like that. And then suddenly the entire nation state inherits that. It's very difficult to rebrand a nation state. Uh, the great example is the country of Georgia. Uh, they, for a long time, were one of the most corrupt countries in Eastern Europe. In fact, it was so bad when you'd fly into the country, they'd give you a bribe list and tell you how much you should expect to pay to bribe various government officials. I mean, talk about like self-defeating behavior. Uh, so they, in the 1990s and the 2000s, uh, got very aggressive at reducing government corruption, including firing their entire police force in Tbilisi. It was a remarkable effort. And they went from one of the most corrupt nations to one of the least corrupt nations of all nation states, including Europe and the United States. However, there's still a latency in that perception. Uh, so when people say, I don't know about Georgia, are you sure you want to do business there? That That's historically been a bad apple. And so that this is a, another part of the magic of blockchain technologies. It helps the government disintermediate itself, in a sense, with its past. And it say, okay, well, I understand it used to work that way, but because it now works in this new system, which is different from us, and it's global by design and it's immutable, uh, now you can trust that even if you don't trust our prior reputation and brand. And I think a combination of these two things will bridge that trust gap. 
and this, by the way, is not exclusive in Africa or Eastern Europe. It's also in the United States. We just had a very traumatic election in 2020. And if you poll people in the United States, about half of my country, uh, because of that election, has very, uh, very strong doubts about the safety, security, fidelity, and trustworthiness of the U.S. election system. Now, it's not an evidence thing. It's a systems thing. No matter what evidence you show and say, no, 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 it was a fair election, still 20, 30 percent are probably going to believe it was a fraudulent election. The only way they're going to change that belief set is through a new system, a different way of voting, a, a different way of audit and oversight, uh, and then they can set the past aside. So uh, as we look to restoring trust or building new trust in other nation states, this is something actually we can use at home, whether it be for vaccine development or it be for voting, it be for the fair distribution of tax dollars or government contracts. Uh, and and uh, what's so cool is it can work on both sides. There's never been a technology where that, that's been the case. Usually it's either top down or bottom up, but there's never been a case where the same framework can be used by the individual at a very low economic rate, $50, all the way up to a nation state, $50 billion, and you're using the same set of tools, the same set of infrastructure. It's pretty magical. Well, clearly, Charles, you're a believer in technology if you think it's gonna restore uh, faith to the US electoral system after what we've seen. But but this is actually what I would like to maybe end on with when I could quickly go around each of the, each of the panelists. I mean, I, I think you wouldn't mind if I describe you all as Afro-optimists you know, this is a continent that, that clearly has its fair share of problems. It, it's, uh, it has a lot of poverty. There is some instability in, in different parts, not everywhere by, by, by any means. There are infrastructure shortfalls. And of course, the continent has been hammered economically by, by COVID-19. And yet here you are, four people kind of talking quite positively um, about this continent. Can I go around each of you and just say, you know, just, just ask, where do you see the continent in the, in the say, five years ahead? And how do you think technology will will play a role in in that vision that you have for the continent? If I could start maybe with Dinal and we could we could go around. Yeah, I mean, there's um, um, when you look at Africa, uh, it's a very youthful place. And uh, uh, you know, I was having a chat uh, the other day uh, with a friend of mine who's an entrepreneur here. He's like. We've got a lot of ideas. Uh, we're never short of ideas. What we lack really is is capital, and um, uh, it's very hard for us to uh, to get our ideas off the ground because normally we need to kind of get a proof of concept together before VCs take us seriously, and we, we need to go the extra mile uh, um, compared to Western countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, really, what we're enabling, and I think what makes me really excited about everything that we're doing, is. Uh, really democratizing access to that finance. So the entrepreneur here on the continent, and there's many of them can, can access this and, and uh, you know, bring these ideas to, to fruition. So I'm really excited. I mean, we're starting with ID, uh, but um, there's other ideas that we've got. Uh, for example, if you look at the catalyst and, and uh, the, the interest we've managed to, to get there from uh, many, many small companies wanting to build, um, bringing that to the continent. So uh, you know, all these entrepreneurs can access uh, that capital as well. So I'm, I'm really positive. I'm excited for them. I think uh, happy to be, you know, work with them on that journey. Jerry, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't categorize myself as an optimist. I'm actually more of a skeptic and a, re and a realist. Um, you know, I've been in the industry for 25 years in the IT industry, and I've seen all the waves of disruptive innovation. And in fact, before I joined this company, this industry, I was quite skeptical. But once you start looking into it, truly looking into it, the data supports it. So just to answer your question about Africa, this is not just about what we think is going to happen and being optimistic. The data supports this, right? There, the economic development, the literacy rates, the connectivity, all that's going in the right direction. Of course, there are, there are problems. Of course, things like pandemics can set things back, but the long-term trend is definitely there. I mean, I think, Charles, you've mentioned this before about thinking of China back in the 70s. I think the analogy is, 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 is very accurate. And I don't see it as optimism, I see it as, as realism. The other side of it is, you know, just going back to the flash from the pan comment before, again, we're, I'm in this industry, I'm seeing real life use cases, I'm seeing the change happen. And there's unique attributes of this new world of blockchain that didn't exist before. And I could see it on the ground happening. And, and there's no surprise that big industries, the institutions are all coming in, the central banks, 
they all see it as well. And if you read all their reports, they know this is going to happen. So I, I don't even see it as if, I only see it as when, as when. And let me just give one example here that just by demonstrating this, you can see there's nothing else that matches this type of capability. So the ID is, is kind of plugging you into this system, the Cardano protocol. The Cardano protocol is not just a technology. It represents millions of people across the world, including small businesses that are looking to solve problems in an open source fashion. So you plug into the system in Africa, and then you could source solutions from across the globe to solve your problems. That's very unique. And I think where we saw in the past, a lot of technologies leading to a digital divide, this technology is, is kind of the first big push out of reversal of the digital divide because it does democratize. It does give power to the edges. And I could just give one use case that I saw recently that really blew my mind. There was this, this, this girl in, in Pakistan who was a very talented artist. And locally, they knew her as a talented artist and she, had, she made these paintings. But of course, she couldn't get finance to become a full-time artist. But with the blockchain, she was able to present her art to the world and managed to get payment through an NFT for her art, which allowed, and again, it wasn't a large sum of money, but for her, it, it allowed her to become a professional artist. I don't see anything else like this. So as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's real. We're seeing the change and it's not a question of optimism. It's a question of realism. The data is there and, you know, as the years go by, the general population will see more and more of it. Right. John, anything to add? You're sitting there in Addis Ababa, I think. I am. That's why my internet connection is not great and you, you may not be able to see me. Um, yeah, you know, for me, the identity shift is going to happen, right? So we're going to be seeing digital identity percolate through all of the, um, you know, the states which we're talking about across Africa. And I think that process has already started and we're just part of that wave. Where I get really excited is starting to think about open finance and how we can drive down the cost of capital for an entrepreneur, for a small and medium um, sized um, enterprise. And that's where I think Cardano is really going to shine. Um, you know, we've got 40, $45 billion of liquidity on the platform right now. If over the next year, we can start to offer finance to smallholder farmers at a much lower interest rate than they can get through local capital, I think we'll have succeeded. And honestly, this is where I see a lot of the blockchain industry going. There's been this obsession with decentralized finance, but let's start with real finance, right? You know, we have people who have economic needs and they have needs for, for loans and for insurance. So let's just do that at a fairer rate. And I think the industry could be proud of itself. So this is where, this is where I hope we're going. And Charles, are the regulators up for this? And 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 is it fair to describe you as a as an Afro optimist? Uh, well, you know, there, first off, there are rich people, poor people, in every place in the world. Uh, go to San Francisco and take a look at how many homeless people are running around. And uh, supposedly, the United States is the wealthiest country in the world. And the reality is that for some people, we're the poorest country in the world, and we're brutal to our impoverished in this country. Uh, so, you know, and people they have this negative opinion or this patronizing opinion. Oh, this, this group or this continent or this country is impoverished. There's no material difference between those people and our people. It's just systems are different and systems are what make people collectively richer or poorer. I, and I, I hate the poverty in my own backyard. I hate the homelessness in my own backyard. I hate the fact that despite the fact we're such a big and powerful nation, there are whole communities that are devastated and, left behind. I can't change that through the ballot box in the United States any more than voting has changed anything in our financial system in the last 25 years. What I can do is change systems and then you go and look for who's in the business of a new system. Yeah, it's kind of funny. We, we, we get startups and we, it's obvious to us that you're going to probably, if you're a clever investor, make a lot more money uh, buying a startup's share and watching it grow and appreciate than buying a share of Microsoft at its $2 trillion valuation. But we don't think about startup nations. It's the same concept, though. It, a nation state has a collection of activities, and it competes against other nation states. And these other nation states are incumbents, and they have systems. And so if you have a startup nation that's actually changing the way it does things, within 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, a huge delta will occur, and those systems will create a collective wealth 
for all the citizens of that nation. Look at Singapore and how far they've gone in 100 years. So I'm in the business of selling systems. That's what blockchain entrepreneurs do. And I would love for the systems I sell to be all around me in the United States. And I don't see a strong uptake or an appetite for that. I see the status quo, and I'm very cynical in that respect. Uh, but I see a huge uptake in Afro, Africa, and it makes me optimistic. Uh, you can't tell me when you have population demographics of 70% at or under the age of 30, and they're internet enabled, that they're just going to accept the status quo. That's a recipe for radical and dramatic change over 10 years or 20 years. And they're not going to go and say, how about we go to a regressive old system that's already been proven to be wrong? They're going to say, let's try something new. Let's experiment, just like Japan did in the 1950s as they were reconstructing their country from the back of World War II. And look at what it did for them. And analogously, the same thing is going to happen throughout the entire continent. And if we're in the right place at the right time, and it really is like being in China in the 1980s or early 90s, where you recognize that it's materially different from the policies of the past. And so that makes me tremendously optimistic. It means that first, we can change the lives of over a billion people. And second, if we do it the right way, because those people are getting really rich really quickly, we can change the lives of all the people around us in our homes, whether it be the UK or it be America, because these nation states are dynamic and they recognize if they're falling behind, they have to change things. Just like newspapers had to recognize that the internet was a threat to their business model. And the ones that admitted it became the New York Times. The ones that didn't became the Rocky Mountain News. I like the Rocky Mountain News. It was a great paper. It's gone. <laughs> there's no one there left. Uh, so so that's that's where we're at. And we're in the systems business. And so I think Africa is the best place to sell what we have. There's an overwhelming demand for it from every side that you can look at. And also, I, I like dealing with young, hopeful, optimistic people. I'll close with this. I had a friend in the aerospace business, and he worked at NASA for a long time. And he told me, he said, SpaceX is going to take us to Mars. And this was right in the early days of space. I said, how do you know? And Musk is not a rocket scientist. He's not, he's not like a big guy in this. He's a, uh, he, because he, his friend was at NASA during the Apollo mission. And everybody in the Apollo mission was young. And they were passionate. And they were just filled with life and vibrancy and joy. And they wanted to change the world. They had this mission. And it was almost like a, a divine quest for them. They, there was no challenge that was too big. To achieve and so they got it done they took us to the moon and you look at nasa today it's very bureaucratic everybody's siloed it's it's everything is slow there's this expectation it takes 10 years to do anything you look at spacex's composition you have all these 25 year old 30 year old guys and gals who are fresh out of school and they honestly believe they're going to mars they're fanatics in that respect so who do you want to bet on do you want to bet on the people who are cynical and bureaucratic and too wise for their own good and say it's never going to happen? Or do you want to bet on the kids who are willing to work 100 hours a week if necessary, every day, seven days a week, with a fanatical resolve to change things? You look at nation states, you ask ourselves, where are we? In America, we have a 79-year-old president. We have this ossified Senate and this Congress. We can't even get an infrastructure bill passed when it's obvious we should do that. And then you look at Ethiopia, and 70% of the population is at around the age of 30. The prime minister is a cryptographer. You know, they're ready to go. They're ready to change. So if I'm in the systems business, I'm selling to them and I'm betting on them because those are the guys that take us to Mars. Those are the guys that are really going to change the world. And if they get it done right, the rest of the world will react. They'll change. And then maybe our own backyards will be a little bit better. Well, as a cynic by profession, it's uh, it's good to hear such uh, such uh, optimism about a continent that I care deeply about. So, uh, so th thanks very much. I found the discussion very uh very interesting, uh, clearly a lot going on, thank you.